Awesome. Hello. Welcome. Um, I am Lynn Root. Uh, I work for Spotify. And um, basically, um, I'm a site reliability engineer at Spotify. Um, and what that means is I either break our entire service or I get paid to fix it when other people do. Um, uh, in actuality, what an SRE does at Spotify um, is because it, it uh, varies widely um, among different companies. It's a combination of um, back-end development, um, where my team and I run a few services that other engineers use daily, and plus a little DevOps and sysadmin. Um, I am also um, our uh, FOSS evangelist. Um, I help a lot of teams release their projects and tools under uh, the Spotify GitHub organization. Uh, and lastly, um, I help lead PyLadies, which is a global uh, mentorship group for women and friends in the Python community. And if you want stickers, I have stickers to give away. Just find me afterwards. Um, so before I start, I want to warn you all um, that I will take all the time allotted for this talk. So there's going to be no time for Q&A. Um, you might think I've purposely done this, maybe, um, to avoid Q&A. But I will be here um, afterwards for the whole conference. Um, so you can just find me um, and to chat. And there will also be a link at the end um, for the, the whole notebook and the example code that I use. All right, so let's get started. Uh, Async.io, uh, the concurrent Python programmer's dream, I guess, uh, the answer to everyone's asynchronous prayers. Uh, the Async.io module has various layers of abstraction, um, allowing developers as much control as they need and are comfortable with. Uh, we have simple hello world examples um, that make it look so effortless, um, but it's easy to get lulled into this false sense of security. Um, this isn't exactly that helpful, right? It's all fake news. Um, <laughs> we're led to believe that we're able to do a lot with the async and await API uh, layer. Some tutorials, while great for getting developers' toes wet, um, try to illustrate real-world examples, but they're just beefed up hello world examples. Some even misuse parts of um, async IO's interface, allowing one to easily fall into the depths of callback hell. Um, some get you up and running um, easily with async I.O., but then you might realize that it's not correct or not exactly what you want, or only gets you part of the way there. Um, so while some tutorials walk through, um, uh, and walkthroughs do a lot to improve upon the basic Hello World use case, sometimes they're just a basic uh, web crawler. Um, and I don't know about you, but at Spotify I'm not building web crawlers. But in general, um, asynchronous programming is just difficult. Um, whether you use async.io or Twisted or Tornado or even Golang or Erlang or Haskell, um, it's just difficult. And so uh, within my team at Spotify, we, which is just mostly me, uh, fell into this false sense of ease um, that the async.io community uh, builds. Um, the past couple of services that we built, we uh, felt were good candidates for async.io. One of them was a chaos monkey uh, like service uh, for restarting uh, instances at random. And then another is um, an event-driven um, host name generation service for our DNS infrastructure. So sure, we needed to make a lot of HTTP requests um, that should be non-blocking, um, but these are services um, that needed to react to PubSub events to um, measure um, the progress of the actions initiated from those events, um, handle any incomplete actions or external errors, um, deal with the whole PubSub manage, um, message lease management, um, measure uh, service level indicators and send metrics. And then we also needed to use some non-async IO friendly uh, dependencies. So it got difficult quick. Um, so um, allow me to provide you with a real world example uh, that actually comes from the real world. Um, if you get the pun, uh, we're building a chaos monkey. Um, Mandrill is a monkey. <laughs> um, so. Uh, we did build a service that does periodic restarts of our entire fleet of instances at Spotify. Um, and we're going to do that here. Here, We're going to build a service called uh, Mayhem Mandrill, which will listen for a PubSub message and restart a host based off of that message. As we build this service, I'll point out traps that I may or may not have fallen into. Um, and this will essentially become a resource that I would have liked about a year ago. Um, so um, at Spotify, uh, we do use a lot of Google products, um, and in this case, a Google uh, PubSub. But there are a lot of choices out there, and we're just going to make um, simulate a simple PubSub-like technology with async.io. Um, this tutorial is uh, quite uh, easy and um, fun to read, I guess. Um, and this is where we're starting off with a very uh, simple like publisher. 
where we're creating um, a set number of instances um, and then adding to the queue. And then we are um, consuming um, that queue. And it's uh, very easy to run, especially with the latest um, Python 3.7 syntactic sugar. Um, and so when we run this, um, we see that we are able to publish and consume messages. So we're going to work off of this. Um, as you might notice, um, oops, a <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, little teaser. Um, we're, we're not actually, uh, we haven't actually built a, a running service. Um, we're merely just like a pipeline or a batch job right now. So in order to continuously run, um, we have to use the uh, loop.runforever. Um, for this, we have to schedule and create tasks out of coroutines and then start the loop. And since we created and started the loop, um, we should clean it up too. So when we um, run this updated code, um, we get this uh, nice little trace back. Um, my mouse screwed over, yep. Um, and then it kind of hangs. So we have to um, cancel it, you have to interrupt it. So yeah, that's nice and ugly, right? Um, so we should probably try and clean that up. Um, so we should um, try and run it a bit defensively. Um, we'll first address um, the exceptions that arise from coroutines. Um, so we'll just go ahead and fake an error. Oh, that did not come out well. Hopefully you can still read that. Um, we're gonna fake an error, so like the fourth message will um, be an error. Um, so if we run it as is, we do get um, an error line, um, and it says exception was never retrieved. And so admittedly, this is a part of the AsyncIO API that's not very friendly. Um, if this was synchronous code, um, we'd simply get the error that was raised, um, but it gets swallowed up in an unre unretrieved task. So to deal with this, as advised by the, uh, the docs, um, we'll need to um, have a wrapper around this coroutine to consume the exception and stop the loop. Um, so we'll make a little top-level wrapper on handle the exceptions of the coroutines. And so when we run our script, just like that, so when we run our script, it's something a little bit cleaner. Um, I'm gonna stop right now. I'm just gonna quickly review. Um, so, so far, setting up an async IO service you want to surface the exceptions um, so that you can like, retrieve them um, and then clean up what you've created. And I will expand on both of these sorts of part, both of these parts a bit later, but it's uh, clean enough for now. Um, so, um, so far, um, we've, <laughs> we've, seen, uh, we, uh, we've seen a lot of tutorials that use the async and await, um, uh, make use of async and await keywords um, while it's not blocking the event loop. Um, we're still literally iterating through tasks serially, um, effectively not adding any concurrency. So if we take a look at our script now, um, we're serially processing each item that we produce and then consume. Even if the event loop isn't blocked, um, there will be other tasks and coroutines going on. They, of course, wouldn't be blocked. Um, but this might be obvious to some, but it isn't to all. Um, we are blocking ourselves. We first produce all the messages one by one, and then we consume them one by one. The loops that we have within the uh, publish and consume coroutines, we block ourselves from moving on to the next message while we await to do something. So this is technically a working example of a pub sub like Q with async IO. Uh, it's not really what we want. Um, we are here to build an event-driven service um, or maybe even a, a batch or um, pipeline job. Um, we're not really taking advantage of the concurrency that AsyncIO can provide. So as an aside, um, I find AsyncIO's API actually quite user-friendly, despite <coughs> what um, some people might think. Uh, it's very friendly or very easy to get up and running with the, that event loop. Um, when first picking up concurrency, this async and await syntax makes it a very low hurdle to start using, um, since it makes it very similar to writing asynchronous code. But again, uh, it's uh, I'm picking up con con concurrency. This API is deceptive and misleading. Yes, we are using the event loop um, and primitives. Um, yes, it does work. Yes, it might seem faster, but it's probably because you came from uh, 2.7. Um, welcome to 2014, by the way. Um, to illustrate that there's no difference in uh, synchronous code, um, this is the same ex um, script, uh, removing um, async IO primitives and using just synchronous code. And you can see, just looking at the consumer, um, there's no real difference other than a couple of weights. Um, and when, you when we run it, it's pretty much the same, and the only difference is actually the randomness part. Um, so part of the problem could be that documentation and tutorial writers um, are presuming knowledge and the ability to extrapolate over simplified examples. But it's mainly because concurrency is just a difficult uh, paradigm to grasp in general. We write our code as we read anything. 
left to right, top to bottom. Uh, most of us are, not, are just not used to multitasking and contact switching that our modern computers allow us. Hell, even if we are familiar with concurrent programming, understanding a concurrent system is just hard. But we're not in over our heads yet. And we can still make this simulated Chaos Monkey service actually concurrent um, in a rather simple way. So to reiterate our goal here, we want to build an event-driven service that consumes from PubSub, process the messages as they come in. Um, we could get like thousands of messages a second, um, so uh, as we get a message, we shouldn't block the handling of the message of the next message we receive. So to help facilitate this, um, we will also need to build a service that um, actually runs forever. We're not going to have um, a preset number of messages. Uh, we'll need to react um, whenever we're told uh, to restart an instance. And so the triggering event to publish a restart request could be an on-demand request from a service owner or it could be a, gradually, a scheduled gradually rolling restart of the fleet. You don't know. So um, we'll first mock uh, the, pu the publisher um, to always be publishing restart message requests um, and therefore in never indicate that it's done. Um, this also means that we're provi not providing a set number of messages to publish, so I had to rework this function. Uh, here I'm just adding the creation of a unique ID um, for each message that's produced. So when running it, it like happily um, produces messages. Um, but you might notice uh, that there is that um, keyboard um, interrupt exception triggered by the control C, and we don't actually catch that. So we can quickly clean that up. Um, this is just a Band-Aid, and I'll explain that further on. But um, now we see something um, much cleaner. So it's probably hard to see why it's concurrent right now. Um, so to help, um, we're going to add multiple producers um, to see the concurrency. Um, for that publish function, I'm going to add a publisher ID um, and uh, have it in our log messages. And then create uh, three publishers just real quick. And then when we run, we can see that we have um, a bunch of publishers going on um, and concurrently. So for the rest of the walkthrough, I'm actually just going to remove all those multiple publishers. I don't want to confuse anything. Now um, onto the consumer bit. So uh, for this goal, um, is to con we're constantly consuming messages from a queue and to create non-blocking work based off a newly consumed message, um, in this case to uh, restart an instance. And the tricky part is that the consumer needs to be written in a way that the consumption of the message from the queue is separate from the work that, the, that happens for that message. So in other words, we have to simulate being event-driven by reacting or by, by regularly pulling messages uh, from a queue, since there's no way to trigger work based off of a new message available in that queue. There's no way to be a push-based. Um, so um, we'll first mock uh, restart work um, that needs to happen um, whenever we consume a message. Um, and we'll stick it in our well-true loop and await for the next message on the queue and then pass it off to restart host. Um, and then we'll just add it to our loop. And then when we run it, we see that um, messages are being pulled and restarted. Um, we may want to do more than one thing per message. Um, for example, we might want to store the message in a database for potentially replaying later as um, we initiate a restart of a given host. So um, within the consume function, we could just add the await for both coroutines. Um, and we'll see that it happens just uh, fine, that both are saved and restarted. Um, but it kind of, we still kind of block the consumption of the messages. And we don't necessarily need to await one coroutine after another. These two tasks don't necessarily need to depend on, um, upon one another. Completely sidestepping the potential concern for uh, should we restart a host if we haven't saved in the database? Um, that's for another time. Um, but we can treat them as such. So instead of awaiting them, we can create a task to have them scheduled on the loop and basically checking it over to the loop for, um, for it to execute when it can. And so now we have like restart and save, not necessarily serially, but whenever um, the loop can, can execute the um, coroutine. As an aside, sometimes you do want your work to happen serially. And maybe you restart hosts um, that have an uptime of more than seven days. Um, or maybe you want to check a balance uh, of an account before you debit it. Um, needing, to code, needing code to be serial or having steps or dependencies, that doesn't mean that you can't be asynchronous. The await last restart date will yield to the loop, but it doesn't mean that the restart host will be the next thing that the loop um, executes. It just allows um, other things to happen outside that coroutine. 
And yes, I admit this was a thing that wasn't immediately apparent to me at first. Um, so uh, we pulled the message from the queue and we found out, fanned out work based off of that message. We now need to perform any finalizing work on that message. So for example, we might need to acknowledge the message so it's not re-delivered. Um, we'll separate this out, um, uh, separate out the pulling of the message from creating work off of it, and then we can um, make use of asyncio.gather to add a callback. So when we run it, um, you can once um, so once uh, both uh, the save coroutine and the restart coroutine are complete, the cleanup will actually uh, will be called, and that signifies that the message is done. However, I'm a bit allergic to callbacks. Um, as well, and perhaps we need uh, cleanup to be non-blocking, so w then we can just await it. Oop, shoot, there we go. Um, now, much like a, a Google PubSub, let's say that the publisher will re-deliver a message um, after 10 seconds if it has not yet been acknowledged, um, but we are able to extend that message deadline. Um, in order to do that, we have to have a coroutine that, in essence, monitors all the other worker tasks so while we are continuing to do work, this coroutine will extend um, the message acknowledgement deadline. Then once we're done, um, we should stop extending the deadline and then clean up the message. So one approach is to make use of async.io event primitives, where we can create event and then pass it to our extend uh, uh, coroutine function, and then set it when we're done. And you can see that it's extending, um, and then it's, it stops extending when the message is actually done. Um, and if you really like events, um, you can make use of event.wait um, and move the cleanup um, outside. And so now we got a little bit of concurrency going on. Um, to review real quick, um, async.io is pretty easy to use, but it doesn't automatically mean that you're using it correctly. Um, you can't just throw around async and await keywords around blocking code. Um, it's actually a shift um, in the, your mental paradigm. Um, both with needing to think of uh, what work can be farmed out and let us do its thing, then you have to think about what dependencies are there and what, where your code might still need to be sequential. But having steps in your code, um, like first A and then B and then C, it might seem like it's blocking when it's not. Sequ sequential code can still be asynchronous. Um, for instance, I might have to call like customer service um, at some point, um, but I'm gonna be on hold for a while so I can just put it on speakerphone and then go play with my super needy cat. Um, so I might be single-threaded um, as a person, but I can definitely multitask um, like CPUs. Um, so earlier, uh, we added uh, try accept finally around our main event loop code. Um, although you probably want your service to gracefully shut down if it receives a signal of some sort, um, like cleaning up um, open database connections, um, stop consuming messages um, and finishing responding to current requests while not accepting new ones. So um, if we happen to restart an instance of our own service, we should clean up the mess um, before we exit out. Um, and so we've been catching this commonly known like, keyboard interrupt exception, um, like many other tutorials and, and libraries, but there are other signals that we should be aware of. Uh, typical ones are like sig up and uh, sig quit and term. Um, there's kill and stop, but um, we shouldn't like, catch them or block them or ignore them. Um, so if we run um, our current uh, script as it is um, and give it a term signal, um, where we find ourselves not actually entering that finally clause where we like log and clean everything up. So we basically um, got to be aware that uh, got to be aware of where those exceptions happen. I also want to point out that even though we're only ever expecting um, keyboard interrupt, um, it could happen outside of catching the exception, potentially causing the service to end up in um, an incomplete or otherwise unknown state. Um, so instead of catching keyboard interrupt, um, let's attach a signal handler to the loop. Um, so first we'll define that shutdown behavior that we want. We want to simulate um, database connections and returning messages to PubSub as not acknowledged um, so that they can be redelivered and not just dropped, and actually canceling tasks. Um, we don't necessarily need to cancel um, pending tasks. We could just collect them and allow them to finish. It's up, it's up to what we want to do. Um, we also might want to take this opportunity to flush any collected metrics so they're not lost. Um, so we need to hook this up to our main event loop now. 
Um, we also, I also removed the uh, keyboard interrupt catch since it's now taken care of within the signal handling. And so we can run this again um, and send it the term signal. Um, and it looks like it, it cleaned up, but you see that we have this caught exception error twice. This is because waiting on canceled tasks will um, raise the async IO canceled error, which is to be expected. Um, and we can add that to our little handle exception um, wrapper as well. So if we run it, um, we actually see our coroutines are being canceled, and not just some random cancel or exception. So you might be wondering which signals should you care about. Uh, apparently, there is no standard. Um, basically, you should be aware of how you're running your service and um, handle them accordingly. Also, as a heads up, um, another misleading API in async I/O is Shield. Um, the docs say that it, a means to shield a future from uh, cancellation. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I have a core dev right here. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> um, if you have a coroutine that must not be canceled during shutdown, uh, Shield will not, will not help you. This is because the task that um, Shield creates um, gets included in uh, asyncio.all tasks and therefore receives cancellation signal just like the rest of the tasks. Um, so to help illustrate, I'm going to have a little simple async function with like a long sleep that we want to shield. Um, and then when we run it um, and cancel it before the 60 seconds, we, don't, we see that we don't ever hit the done line and that it's immediately canceled. Um, so yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so TLDR, um, we don't uh, actually have nurseries to, uh, in async IO core to clean up ourselves. Um, it's up to us to be responsible um, and close up the connections and files that we open, um, responding to um, outstanding requests and um, basically leaving things how we found them. So um, doing our cleanup in a final clause isn't enough, uh, since a signal could be sent outside of a try accept clause. Um, as we uh, construct a loop, uh, we should uh, tell how it should be deconstructed as soon as possible. Um, it ensures that all of our bases are covered and we're not leaving any artifacts around. Um, and finally, um, we need to be aware of when our program sh um, should shut down, which is closely tied to how we run our program. If it's just a manual script, then SIGINT is fine. If it's a demonized Docker container, then SIG term is probably more appropriate. You may have noticed that we're not actually catching exceptions um, within like restart host and save, just on the top level. So to show you what I mean, we're gonna fake an error where we can't restart a certain host. And so running it, um, we see that a host can be restarted, and while the service did not crash, it did save to the database, um, and it did, did, but it did not clean up or act the message. And the extend um, on the message deadline will also keep spinning. So we've effectively deadlocked on the message. A simple thing to do is to add uh, return exceptions true within our async IO gather. So rather than completely dropping an exception, we can turn it um, with our successful results. Um, however, you can't really see um, what actually um, aired out. So uh, what we could do is add a callback. Um, but as I said, I'm allergic. Um, so we can just add a little like helper function to process the results afterwards. And so when we use something like this, um, we can see errors are now logged and we can handle them appropriately. So a quick review, um, exceptions do not uh, crash the system unlike uh, async IO programs, and they might, um, non-async IO programs, and um, they might go unnoticed. And so we need to account for that. And I personally like using async IO gather because the order of the return results are deterministic, um, but it's easy to get tripped up with it. Um, by default, it will swallow exceptions, and, but happily continue working on other tasks. Um, and if an exception is never returned, then weird behavior can happen, um, like spinning around a, an event. All right, so I'm sure folks, as, as, you, as you've started using async IO, um, you might have realized that async IO or async await starts infecting the rest of your code base. Everything needs to be async. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, it just forces a shift in perspective. Um, so for our code to work with this, we need to sort of maybe rework um, our consumer. Uh, not much is needed, actually. Um, I'm still making um, use of a synchronous consume coroutine to call an, a non-async consumer and I'm using a thread pool executor um, to run that code. 
As an aside, there's actually um, a handy little package called AsyncIO Extras, which provides a decorator for asynchronous functions um, where it would remove the boilerplate for you um, and you can just await the decorated function. Um, but sometimes third-party code throws a wrench at you. If you're lucky, you'll f you're faced with a third-party library that is multi-threaded and blocking. So for example, um, Google PubSub's Python library makes use of gRPC under the hood with threading, but it also blocks when opening up a subscription, um, and it also requires a non-async callback for when a message is received. So in, in typical Google fashion, they have some uber cool technologies and slightly difficult to work with uh, libraries. Um, so this feature that they return, um, it makes use of gRPC um, for bi-directional communication and it removes the need for us to periodically pull from messages as well as manage message deadlines. Um, so to illustrate, um, we can use run and executor again. I've made a little helper function to kick off the consumer um, and, and the publisher. Um, and to prove that this is now non-blocking, um, I'm gonna create a little dummy coroutine to run alongside run pubsub. Um, we'll add uh, the two, um, we'll add the two coroutine functions and update the main. Um, so it's just the run um, method or run function that we're um, running. And we can see that it's um, not uh, blocking. But as I said, uh, that although it'll do a lot for us, um, there's a lot of threads in the background and like 15 threads in the background that the Google PubSub library gives us. So I'm gonna reuse that something else um, coroutine um, to actually periodically get some stats on the threads that's going on. And I've also prefixed our own thread pool executor so I can easily tell which one I created versus what Google created. <laughs> and when running this, um, you can see that Google creates a lot of, a lot of threads. Um, we have the main thread, um, which is the async IO event loop. And there's five threads from us because we've given it five workers. Um, and then the rest of it is, is Google. And so this current thread count is like 22. Um, but all in all, like the, the approach to threaded code isn't that different than um, uh, non-async code. Um, until you realize that you have to call asynchronous code from non-async function within that thread. So obviously we can't just act um, a message once we receive it. Um, we have to restart the required host and save the message in our database. So we basically have to call asynchronous code from a, a non-async function in a separate thread. Um, pretty embarrassing, bear with me. Um, and I got like two minutes to um, run through this. Um, we'll use uh, the async IO uh, create task um, um, that we defined earlier. But then we realized that yes, of course, there's no event loop running. And to get a little more color, um, uh, here's some uh, log lines that yes, indeed, no event loop is running in the thread. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I can hear people say, read, read the docs, Lynn. <laughs> um, but what if we gave it the loop that we're running in? Um, and it kind of works, but it's deceptive. We're just, we're just lucky here. Um, once we share an object between um, the threaded code and the callback and the asynchronous code, we've essentially shot um, ourselves in the foot. And to, uh, to show you that, I've created a, a global queue um, that um, the consumer will add to and then we'll read off that queue um, with handle message. And um, you see something funky now. Um, nothing is ever being consumed from that global queue. Um, and so if we add a line um, in that queue, in that function, we can see the queue size gradually increasing. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you see what's going on here. We are not thread safe. So let's make use of um, run coroutine thread safe and see what happens. Yes, it finally fucking works. <laughs> um, so um, in my opinion, it's not that difficult to work with synchronous code in async IO. However, it is difficult to work with threads, particularly with async IO. So if you must use um, the thread safe APIs that async IO gives you, or um, you can just hide away and try to ignore it. Oh. <laughs> Uh, so in essence, this talk is something that I would have liked to hear about a year ago, so I'm speaking to Passlin here, but hopefully there are others that benefit from this, um, from a use case that's not just a simple web crawler. Um, everything is up there, um, up on that URL, so um, hopefully it's useful to folks. Thank you.